So this is the first year we're doing this, um, a little slightly different from what we were doing last year. Um, but the purpose of this event is, I guess, you know, just for you guys to, um, you know, think about, um, you know, what HIV is. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows about it, and, but things have changed from what it used to be. Like, um, you may hear that the recommendations for testing have changed um, uh, in the news that it used to be that only people who are at risk should get tested, and, um, but nowadays the recommendations have changed, and maybe through this discussion you may think, you may, um, you know, your viewpoints may change, or there's questions that you, you want to ask, and we hope that through this discussion uh, you guys can you know, have a renewed sense of uh, what uh, you may want to accomplish in our community in terms of HIV awareness. Um, uh, just remember in your seats there are those quilts, and we hope that throughout this uh, service you are mindful of the ones who uh, you know uh, may have been affected by the disease, and um, you know we can write put those names and put those on the quilt at the very end. Um, so without further ado, we will start. So our purpose tonight is to really have a conversation. We're bringing together different folks from uh, different agencies. We really want to have a conversation um, to see how these two worlds, faith, HIV, the communities of those living in, uh, with HIV or who have passed, to, to really bring, to bridge the gap between that community and the church. And so we're going to be introducing you to the agencies who are joining us tonight. And I, this will actually work. Yeah, great. Um, and so, without further ado, I want to first introduce uh, Alex Lee to come. He's with Asian and Pacific Island Wellness Center, so you can, you can sit anywhere on the beautiful sofas. Great, then just grab a mic there. So, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do at API, what API is, and uh, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, hi, my name is Alex, and I'm from the Asian and Pacific Islander Wellness Center. We're located around two blocks away at Polk and Ellis Street. So we're just a hop and a drop away. And um, what we do is, um, we were created um, 25 years ago when um, the AIDS epidemic was um, raging through San Francisco. And um, the Asian and Pacific Islanders that had contracted um, HIV and were living with HIV realized that there were no resources that were um, geared towards the Asian and Pacific Islander community for HIV. So that's when, um, the APIs living with HIV, as well as the Gay Asian Pacific Alliance, came together and tried to address this need by creating the Asian Pacific Islander Wellness Center. And so it's just Asians and Pacific Islanders now? It's a, is it just for Asians and Pacific Islanders now, or I mean, have you opened your doors to other groups? So since then, um, we've expanded our services to um, everyone. Um, we, primarily serve the API community, as well as the um, folks living in the tender one. So um, on Mondays, we have our um, HIV care services for Asian and Pacific Islanders living with HIV. We also have our tender one area center of excellence clinic or taste clinic, and that serves primary, primarily the um, tender one population, regardless of race, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, immigration status. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, what do you do there? So my job at the agency is to run the HIV testing clinic. So we have drop-in HIV testing from Tuesdays through Saturdays. Um, times um, vary from day to day. Um, however, um, anyone can come in regardless of um, your background or whatnot um, to get a test. And test um, only takes 15 minutes and it's a finger prick test. So you prick your finger, kind of like a blood pressure test, and um, we just get one drop of blood and run the test like that. Okay. And you're actually gonna do that today for anybody that wants to after service. Uh, we're gonna offer free confidential uh, rapid tests here in the fireside room. It, it is confidential. Would you tell us a little bit about, a little bit about how that works and, and who could do that and, and just talk about that for a minute? Okay, so the test itself, like I said before, it takes only 15 minutes and it is a blood test. Um, the test itself looks for HIV antibodies, not the virus itself. So antibodies are made when you have been infected with HIV in order to fight off the virus. So it's kind of like a defense mechanism that your body has. And it can take anywhere from two weeks to up to six months from the day you were infected for your body to make enough antibodies to show up on this test, with most people taking around three months. 
So say you've been infected last night, then this test would not reflect your current status, although you have been infected, because your body did not have enough time to respond and make those antibodies. Okay, so if I, if I got tested a few months ago, it's still beneficial for me to, to test today? So um, the city of San Francisco recommends everyone to get tested every three to six months, because um, it can take up to six months, but um, people average around three months to make antibodies, so it's just good to get tested at least every six months if you are sexually active. And, and I'm, uh, I'm going to just step out on them. I'm going to get tested after the service. I'm going to break the ice. Pastor Maria is going to get... You want to you want to say something? Or? Yeah, I do want to ask. First of all, I'm, if you've been in a committed relationship for 22 years, I guess you still should probably think about getting tested, right? Yes, um, okay. we do have clients that are in monogamous relationships, married, that have contracted HIV because their partners may have cheated on them or whatnot, or if they may have been infected with jerry needles or. Right. Other methods of training. Well, like for myself, I work in the healthcare profession. You never know. If, Definitely. You know. The other question is: Is are there false positives? So the test that we used to do before January first, two thousand twelve, was a oral sample test. So it used saliva. However, when we found that that test came back with lots of or several um, false positives, and that's why as of last year, January first, two thousand twelve. We, uh, the whole city has changed to the blood rapid test, and that is 99.8% accurate. So it's very, very, very accurate. Very and so far in San Francisco, we have no false positives. So what kind of support do you have to test positives? So we have, um, we have a case manager which helps the clients navigate the healthcare system um, and make sure they get the care that they need and within the healthcare system. We also have peer advocates who um, support them on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of help them adjust to knowing their status and kind of breaking the news to their family members or um, dealing with the stigmas in their community and whatnot. So. Very cool. And with that, do you, uh, any final, anything, any initiatives you got guys you have going on right now, anything you want to plug? So, we have lots of initiatives. Um, our agency does lots of um, work, um, starting from policy work and kind of getting the news out, saying um, Asian and Pacific Islander communities are affected with HIV and that we do need um, we, we do need a voice. Um, oftentimes, people believe that we're, our community is not affected, and that's not true. And oftentimes, we are left out of national health care reform policies because of that. So we're always trying to serve as a voice for the API community, um, for those living with HIV. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're, he's going to stick around and be with us, so make him feel welcome. Yeah. And uh, our next person I want to introduce is Father River Sims with Tim and his Catholic Woo! worker. And uh, so glad to have you join us. That is not one seat, by the way, it's two, so just don't sit in the middle. <laughs> so welcome, and uh, we're glad you, you, you're no stranger to FIC. You've been here a number of times, and you've actually spoken at this kind of service before. But tell uh, some of those that are new to us a little bit about what you do and the, the ministry that you have in the, in the Polk District. Uh, I have Tim Mills Catholic Worker, which for 19 years has uh, done street outreach in the area and in the Polk area. And I work late at night, like uh, from about 6 o'clock at night to 3 in the morning. And I work with street kids, and I work with anyone, but primarily kids, if I, when they're out, out there. And we do harm reduction, which is needle exchange, and uh, we feed people, and I do pastoral counseling and care. And that's, uh, my ministry is a ministry. It's a ministry of uh, not preaching verbally, like St. Francis said, use as few words as possible to preach the gospel. And I touch people, and we touch people's lives by working with them where they are. Like two nights ago, I spent most of the night taking a 22-year-old back and forth to the hospital. Uh, he just got out of the hospital trying to get meds, and he had been here two or three days when he went to the hospital, and he's not connected to any of the services. And he could not get his medication. He also was tested and found he was HIV positive. He was in a struggle about that, and he fit in nowhere. And so I usually work with the ones that no one else really touches. They are out late at night, or they don't fit into the services, because they don't one thing, they cannot uh, just they, they cannot play the game, frankly. Like this kid the other night, I, I spent half the night intervening with him and the hospital staff because he starts screaming at them, and they didn't want to even put up with him. Uh, and so that's what I do. 
Awesome. And, and how long have you been doing this work? Yeah, 19 years. 19 years. Um, and you started as a child. You started as a child, yeah, right out of the room. At five. So just kind of, if you could, paint a picture of what the Polk District looks like or the Hay District looks like after midnight on a weeknight. I mean, who's, who is out there? Uh, Both Polk and Hay. I'm in the Hay usually from about six to eight and then the Polk after that. And Polk, as a, their partners out there, and the kids in the, in, in the park are getting uh, they hang out and they uh, are uh, trying to make money. And then they start going back in the park to sleep. And uh, usually it's, uh, it, the later it gets, the longer they get, the worse it gets because it's cold and it's dark. And then the police are out to arrest them, it's even worse. Uh, on Polk Street after midnight, Polk Street's changed in the last 19 years. When I first came here, it was hustling. It was, for, it was a gay street. Now it's basically, except for, I'm not even sure they want to call it, we even have any gay bars there now. And so it's about after midnight that uh, the drug addicts come out that people who use drugs come out, and that's when people come out and I work with. I do needle exchange, and that's when I do most of my needle exchange. And people will say to me that there's no one out there using it anymore. I still got the same number of needles, it's about 10,000 a month. Uh, same thing to hate, uh, they're just undercover. And unless you, and if they know you, they come out. And they sleep in the alleys, they sleep in the doorways late at night, and uh, they're there, and the, the city tends to, it's like I was telling Maria today, today at lunch, or at breakfast, uh, you, ever, you hardly ever hear homelessness anymore mentioned in the newspaper. And like, for example, Mayor Lee has mentioned it very seldom. Uh, and then the ones that are missed are the 9 or 10% that I work with, the ones that do not access services. And they're the ones that I advocate for. Uh, they're the ones who are left out. And HIV is on the rise with them. It's always been on the rise. And they have trouble getting into treatment. Uh, this kid the other died in general because he was not in the program now. Uh, we could not get his medication. And he had about five months or 10 minutes of counseling for his HIV. So I spent hours with him that night dealing with his HIV and his diagnosis. Uh, if you don't fit in the peg, you don't get anywhere. And in, in the city now, it's becoming a time when we don't really pay much attention to who's out there. We tend to stay on our iPads, we stay on our iPhones, and we ignore people who are really in need. And the church especially tends, sometimes tends to do that uh, because we tend to be, we're, we don't want to have to face it and face what we need to do. Well, we're very glad you're here tonight, and I thank you for being here. And God help us up with some water. So let's make River for a welcome. Woo you are part of the Father River, or this river, whatever you want to hate you, so welcome. And Can I just share one brief thing? Sure. I, I'm not trying to make this longer than, I remember the first time I went out on the street with River, and he wanted to take me and show me what he did. So he had one bag filled with needles and condoms and lube, and the other bag filled with, like, candy, okay? And here I, I'm the one toting the bag, because that's how he gets you to help you. You know, you, you have to do the work. You're strong. And here, here we are doing this. And my first impression really was, as an evangelical pastor, thinking, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be telling them you can't do this. And then God just switched the gear in me and said, you know what? These people are going to do what they're doing. And what he's doing is really reaching them with, with harm reduction, so that... He's loving them as Jesus would love them, is what he's doing. And he's giving them something to protect their, themselves so that they can live longer and hopefully realize that Christ loves them and, and do something with their lives. But it was really amazing. And I will tell you, I would have never known half of those people who were out there, but as soon as he hit the pavement, and please don't take this wrong, but in Brooklyn, we, we tend to have cockroaches in Brooklyn. And the only time you knew the cockroaches were around is in the middle of the night when you flip on the light to go to the bathroom because you wanted to do that because if not, you would step on them, okay? It was just like that. When he came out of the doorway, people just, hey, hey, father, hey, father, and he, they knew. They knew he was on the street. Amazing stuff. If you ever get the opportunity, he'll take you out there to show you what he does. Awesome. Good so work. We're, we're glad you're here. Tuesday and you. Thursday night, we serve hot meals, one in Hemlock Alley on Thursday, and then we serve one up in Church and Market, and Needle Exchange, and then in, and then in uh, Stanion, on Stanion in the Golden Gate Park, we serve about 800 people a week. Wow. Excellent. Glad you're here.
Our next, uh, our next guest is Issa Noyales from Lyric. Would you welcome Issa? I said your last name right, correct? No. <laughs> correct me, please. Uh, I'm Issa Noyola. I go by he or she pronouns. And I am a program manager at Lyric. It's a queer LGBT trans youth organization in the Castro. And we've been around since 1988. And I also run a program in the mission um, called Ela Para Trans Latinas, and it's a, a trans Latina program uh, that emerged from HIV prevention. Um, it was called the the organization before um, when I when I first got started it was called Proyecto Contra Sida Por Vida, which is Project Against AIDS. And so um, the trans program that that whole organization closed, and the only remaining program that stayed was the trans uh, program. And so. Um, we've managed to survive uh, since, nine, since 2004, um, and we're in located at the heart of the mission on 16th and Cap. Great, right. and what are some of the things that you guys do there? Uh, well, I mean, for both, I think, um, Lyric and Ella, I mean, it's, it's really about, um, we're working with marginalized communities that um, primarily use of color and, um, and trans-Latina monolingual immigrant women who, um, who really, in terms of accessing services like um, mainstream services in HIV care, just in any kind of um, uh, community-based organization, you know, there's really um, some challenges because of language, because of documentation, because of just not really um, being reflected in, in the staff or not being reflected in, in, in their environment. So um, the challenges in terms of working with uh, our, our populations in San Francisco for, for youth and for trans women um, are really difficult and it's not um, your standard kind of uh, care, just having uh, testing days or sort of like these mainstream ideas of, of like accessing services, you know, or like providing services to the community. So we're really um, about building community, creating safety, um, cre creating safe spaces um, for youth and for trans women to uh, feel safe just to kind of be and um, with the rates of violence that are um, that these uh, populations, uh, our communities face um, being so high, uh, one, in, one, in, one in 12 trans women will face uh, uh, assault, not just verbal but uh, physical assault um, for trans Latina women. Um, so the rates of violence are really high. Um, and so in creating safety and creating those environments, I think that we're then able to kind of talk about health, we're able to talk about these root causes of, of um, that puts folks at risk. And so um, I think that our main priority in, and in our, our goals in programming and in, in the in spaces that we um, provide are, are definitely around creating safety so we can have folks and meet them where they are, where they're at, so that then we can have other conversations about health and testing and other, you know, other services that they're needing. So. And do you all have any current initiatives or any program or projects that you're working at the moment? Um, I mean, so so for Ella, I mean, we've been so at Ella, we our major funding in the city comes from HIV prevention from the Department of Public Health. Um, we're in a collaborative with API Wellness through a trans uh, the trans female. Um, testing uh, um, initiative um, and so uh, that's and so since then I mean we've just historically all of our, our, our programming has been based on this HIV harm reduction model um, but really um, a lot a lot of our work too has also been violence prevention work within the community just because of the rates of violence um, within our community are so high. So um, we've been really mobilizing and advocating recently within the last couple of months around um, really kind of highlighting this issue for the city because the city has um, never uh, funded or really looked at um, trans uh, communities in terms of violence prevention. And so, um, and knowing that, the, again, the rates for, um, for trans females, um, the rates of HIV are super, super high. Um, for trans women, it's again, one in 12. So, um, so really li trying to um, broaden the conversation um, in terms of the needs of the community, not just being HIV, um, and not just kind of being stigmatized around HIV, because I think that in general our communities, or for trans communities specifically, 
that's all kind of been, that's where the conversations lived around just HIV, but the needs of the community are so much, are larger. So, um, and then just for Lyric, I think that we've been, um, again, around this idea of building uh, leadership within our youth so that they're able to speak um, for themselves and able to advocate for them for um, the needs in their different communities. Because we have youth that, I mean, most of the youth that, um, come to Lyric are not, don't live in the Castro, they live in the Mission, they live in the Bayview, they live in the Tenderloin, they live in various other parts of the city. So really having um, all the knowledge that we have, we have different groups that meet for queer young men, for young women, for trans youth. Um, and so like really giving them the information, the tools they need so they can go back to their community and kind of share, so. Great, well, we're very glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So let's let's dive into this. We're have uh, we're going to have another panelist join us in a little bit, but uh, just amongst these ministries and agencies here. So HIV, where are we at in 2013 today? Uh, like, what is going on? I, I I remember my first HIV test was about 10 years ago, and I was scared to death. And uh, but where where have we come in the last uh, t you know 30 years since since the since the epidemic? And what are you seeing in the community that that you represent? So any, anybody can chime in here. What I see is uh, HIV tends to be, when I first came here, uh, people were terrified of HIV. And now it's less terror because of new drugs. And it's not mentioned as much. You know, I've seen very few billboards out there about HIV anymore. And that concerns me. That concerns me because HIV is still very present. And the drugs don't exactly, I mean, they may not always work. And, and they also have really terrible side effects. And for the population, for the kids that I work with, for the youth that I work with, they, it's, it's hard for them to access treatment, okay? And uh, it's almost impossible for some of them because they're, because they're mobile. They move, they move all the country, they go where they want to go. And uh, even if they did access treatment, it's, almost impossible to keep the drugs. And so we need to be more aware. We need to be more aware of HIV. We need to keep pushing it still very present. San Francisco is blessed because of the resources where other cities aren't still. When the homeless population is ignored a lot. Alex, so would you would you say that access to services is really kind of the new the new issue that it's not so much just awareness of HIV, but how do I get treatment and meds and support? I definitely access to services, and I, and but I, I think to me, I mean, I think about like where HIV, like the the really where all the funds really came from, is because the community really um, like powers of the people and like this idea around mobilizing and, and like these organizations like ACT UP and there was just a lot of activism and like a lot of folks really being visible and putting um, giving this voice to say like we we. You know, our communities deserve health care, we deserve respect, we deserve dignity. And I think that I, I've seen just in general just like this like more apathetic kind of stance on just because of these designer drugs that exist that most communities, most of the, the higher risk communities really can't access those like high end drugs. But um, I think that there is just this apathy and because of that I think we're seeing these um, this like decreasing in funding. Um, criminalization also just um, for our, our, in terms of the community, I mean, like, um, I'm not sure if folks are aware, but like, um, in San Francisco and across uh, the United States, folks can, you know, get pulled over or get um, arrested or kind of questioned by cops if you're carrying more than, I think, two or three condoms in, on, on your person. And so for a lot of our, like, for our outreach workers at ELA, and uh, Lyric, they've been questioned by police in the Tenderloin when they're doing street outreach, and and like and because they're stigmatized already, um, they've been you know like they've had to like show ID, show I'm from Elam doing this community outreach, and so in that, um, I know that San Francisco has been having that conversation. There's been a stay, but still, I mean, it's still a reality in other in, in other cities, um, and I just think that because there's the community has kind of lost its edge in regards to these other issues other than marriage, um, in terms of being visible and in the activism. I just feel like there's these other kind, of, like other other issues and and, other, and the.
kind of more conservative or ideas um, are being pushed, these other agendas, these other ideas that are kind of wanting to kind of suppress our community. And so I just feel like our community needs to be more like active and more, you know, in, in, in the community in terms of raising awareness. So you know, you talk about condoms, uh, <laughs> needle change. And supposedly you you can have needles, but the, but it depends on the cop. I mean they will use all they will use that to get people up in a minute. And it's not you know it's not uniform. And so I don't care what the law says, what they're told. I've had kids picked up because they're carrying needles. And uh, uh, HIV is spread by the use of dirty needles. Hepatitis is spread. And those needles need to be kept in their hands. But that's a one, I, I gave a young man a needle the other night, and he was terrified because he'd been taken in two weeks ago and having a clean needle on it. Alex, what are you saying related to this? So, statistically speaking, um, HIV in San Francisco is no longer an epidemic, meaning, um, or rather it's an endemic, meaning it's a controlled disease. Um, so we are averaging around 400 new infections in San Francisco every year. Um, however, I think what the epidemic is now is, like um, these two speakers have previously mentioned, it is really the stigma surrounding HIV. And this stigma acts as barriers um, to accessing these services, accessing care, and being retained in care. Um, so, I would say it's really about the stigma and um, it's really important for us to educate ourselves about how HIV is transmitted, how you can protect yourself, and if you do have contracted HIV, uh, what can you do and to support them socially as well as, you know, where, um, what resources around the community that they can access. And maybe each one of you, specifically, like, put some feet to that word stigma. I mean, I, I hear it a lot, but... What does it mean? I, for, for my days, it was like, I can't share the toilet with someone. You know, that was mis, miseducation with stigma. But what is the stigma that you're really seeing in the communities that you work with? I see the stigma of homeless youth. I see the stigma of being homeless, being kids, and the stigma of thinking that, you know, they need to get off the street, make their families, get back into work, and if they don't do that, then they're no good, they deserve what they get. I see the stigma not being recognized, and, uh, and I mean, that's what makes me angry, is people don't see people as human beings who are, who are the image of Jesus. That's the way I look at people. Every person is the image of Jesus Christ. And that's how we should treat them. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I think it's, um, it's, for our folks in terms of the work that we do, it's really, um, to really, in addressing the stigma, it's, it's both coming from the outside, but then it's internalized. You know, and so really kind of, you know, to do that work, that interpersonal work, and to, to because our communities, um, the, the rates and the risks of HIV are compounded and made exponentially higher when folks have obstacles to employment, when folks have obstacles to having their pronouns respected when they go to a clinic, um, when there's no housing opportunities, when all these, um, barriers and um, areas in your life are not made available to you or it's, it's harder to access those because of your gender presentation, because of um, just the stigmas that society has in regards to trans people, trans monolingual folks, uh, youth of color, um, because of those rates are higher and it's, it's, it's more difficult, then I think that um, the stigma is made real and so like you you care less about yourself you care less because you 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 are are seeing how difficult it is to navigate in your life and here in San Francisco and um, and you know we have youth that come from various places in the United States and thinking it's San Francisco's like this haven and you know this Mecca for, you know they're gonna be able to do all these and access all these kinds of things and the reality is that the waiting list for beds for emergency beds are high there's waiting lists across the board for just so many services. And, you know, they're really, the, there's, every year there's like more limited spaces for youth and for trans women specifically. Um, every year, like Ella's open um, um, in the mission. We're open from five o'clock to nine. We're the only program in the Bay Area that's open in the evening for trans women from Tuesday um, through Friday. Um, because we're meeting the community where they're at. And so, um, Again, at youth spaces, um, queer youth spaces in the city are becoming less and less and less, are deprioritized because the city sees it as, you know, not being effective in terms of 
um, it's, you know, there's other places to put that money into um, other initiatives. So I think that just, there's, those are the challenges I think with the stigmas is both internally and then just from um, a standpoint of the different institutions that exist to kind of keep folks in their place, you know, and, you know, let's all just stick them in the tenderloin because that's where all the housing should be for, you know, marginalized communities. Let's, and so that, you know, that, what message does that send to folks when you like, I can, the only housing I have or the only opportunities I have are in the tenderloin or, in, or, or other areas that are highly stigmatized from the rest of the city, you know, so. Excellent. You want to get the last word in on this, Alex? Sure. I would say um, stigma, at least, um, in the API community is, um, People being, being blamed by um, getting the disease, like they deserve it. And as a result, they are um, discriminated against and they're isolated by their communities. And we have lots of clients who are really afraid to you know, tell um, their community about their status, fearing that they may be rejected completely by their parents or their family members or churches or um, communities. And also, there are cases where um, folks have been fired from work when they um, came opened up about their HIV status to their coworkers. There have been people, there are people who go to the hospital and ask for an HIV test as an Asian or Pacific Islander, and the doctor refusing them because um, the doctor believes that we're at low risk. And um, sometimes they find out 10 years later with full-blown AIDS in the ER um, because they have been discriminated against in those ways. So those are some of the ways stigma can affect um, people um, living with HIV. In the black community especially, HIV is on the rise. Uh, homophobia is terrible in some of the churches in the black community. I mean, I have, have black ministers basically tell me I'm going to hell. And, uh, and, and so we, we're dealing with that. We're, de we're dealing with homophobia. And in San Francisco, you know, I think there's, there's discrimination against blacks, big time. Yep. And they're being pushed out of the city and services they have trouble accessing services. And we need to remember that, okay? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, did you, did you want to jump in? Go ahead. Um, at our agency, we also have a trans drop-in center and a resource center, and we do offer testing for um, trans um, folks that are interested in getting tested. And what we've noticed statistically um, is that one in five trans women, um, black women, that get tested or come back HIV positive. So that really speaks to what he has spoken wow. about. We're gonna push pause here and uh, give you guys a break. Thank you, you can take your seat, we'll call you back up in a little bit. Can, can we give them a hand clap for what we have now? Um, my story begins uh, really way back in 1996. I was in, in Atlanta working for uh, the big companies like Coca-Cola and AT&T. I was at the top of my game, and, uh, making lots of money being a computer data analyst crunching lots of information into one moving form, kind of like what the government is doing now. You can yeah. follow the news. <laughs> I find it kind of funny that the government's doing what I used to do at at and uh, So I didn't really care about anything but making money and didn't care about my health very much. My diet was awful and didn't even think about testing, <laughs> uh, even though I knew I was at risk. And uh, in January, I began having strange uh, pains in my back and didn't know what it was. I thought I slept funny, thought I was a pensioner, didn't give it any mind. And then I, I began having these uh, fevers and I brushed them off and then I started having this terrible headache like you wouldn't believe. And um, <laughs> again, I was too busy working, didn't think about it, never been to a doctor hardly in my life, never been sick in my life. So I just kept on working and kept hoping that the headaches would go away. And finally, they got too much to bear. So I finally broke down and went to the doctor in uh, the latter part of January. And uh, he took like, one look at me and he said, excuse me, sir, you're about to die. You need to go to the hospital. And I said, oh, 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 my goodness. He said, I'm not even going to charge you. That should have been, I should, uh, I should have known something was up at the end. You know, the doctor said they won't charge you. Um, and uh, so I went to the emergency room and uh, it was packed. I didn't get to see a doctor for a couple of hours, you know how that goes. And this little intern looked like Noah Wadley from ER. Um, 
And he took one look at me and said, well, I don't think there's anything wrong, you know, I don't think you have what the doctor said uh, you had. And I told him what the doctor previously had said. So he sent me home with his little pills, said, you'll feel better, come back in about a week. Well, I did not feel better in about a week. In fact, I got much, much worse, and uh, my eyesight started going, and that really scared me. I was in Target, and I uh, was getting some pain medication for my neck, it was killing me. And all of a sudden, everything started kind of uh, getting blurry and, and having after images, and I thought, oh no, I'm going blind. I don't want to go blind in Target, not in Target, no. <laughs> I don't want Target to be the last thing I see. But um, by the grace of God, I, I, an idiot, I got in my car, and I drove home, I lived about a mile away, and I had to make many turns and corners. And I, I kind of remember going through a ditch and hitting a fence, and I don't know how I got home, but I, I did manage to get home, and it collapsed on the living room floor. And so um, the next day, uh, I went to the emergency room again, and of course, they, uh, I told them the symptoms I was having, the back pain, the headaches. And they said, well, we do a CAT scan, and then we have to do uh, you know, some more tests. So they came back to, uh, about an hour later and said, uh, we need to admit you. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> so about a week or so later, things got really bad. And I began really going downhill. And so the doctors had to put me into a medical-induced coma because um, if I was moving around very much, the fungus might get into my lungs and into my heart, and there was no hope for that. Um, and at the time, my eyesight was going down and my hearing was you know, really getting bad. And then they put me in the coma, and uh, I was in the coma for three and a half months. And I guess because it was a medically induced coma, I, I, it was sort of like being in a dream for three months. Can you imagine dreaming, going to bed and dreaming and waking up three and a half months later? Um, I remember every moment that I was in the coma. And some coma patients do remember, but I, I do remember uh, everything, every moment. It was an amazing time. I, I did have a vision, uh, I guess it was just a dream, but when I think about it, kind of sends shivers down my spine because um, I thought I was dead. So I thought, well, I'll go to heaven. So I can't, you know, imagine myself going up to heaven. But then all of a sudden I went down. And then I went down and down until I went into the bowels of the earth. And uh, I don't know if I told the church, I kind of touched on this a couple years ago, but some of you may have not heard this part yet. Um, I actually, in my dream, went to hell. And I did see Satan. And um, he was, uh, he looked like Darth Vader on steroids. That was about the best way I could describe him. Um, just a scary kind of guy. And he just um, kept telling me there was no hope and uh, that I had to stay with him. That, you know, uh, if I did wake up, you know, I would be blind and deaf. And, and so why bother? And so he led me throughout the world and um, it was uh, kind of interesting. I, I was Buddhist at the time, so I, I kept seeing the images from Revelation, and I thought, well, that's odd. Why should I be seeing that? I mean, I'm not Christian. I'm Buddhist. I had left, you know, left my Christian beliefs because of the persecution and uh, because of the unaccepting of the homosexuality in mainstream church, especially in the United Pentecostal Church. So... Um, I kept wondering, you know, why am I seeing these things? I saw the moon turn to blood, and uh, that was an interesting experience. And one thing that really makes me wonder whether it was a dream or not is um, it was not a well-known fact. In the book of Revelation, it talks about a creature coming up from hell, um, and it stings people like a, a scorpion sting them, and it flies around. And so I saw that. I actually saw that in my dream or nightmare, uh, hallucination, um, and I heard sting people and they were screaming with intense pain and I, I kept asking them, you know, I didn't particularly name him Satan, but I kept asking them, you know, what's going on, why are these people doing that, why are you doing that to these people? And um, so he, he just called me impudent and, uh, but I, I just, uh, I thought maybe at one, at one point, I thought maybe he was an uncle, and he kept wanting me to join him in his kingdom. And 
I, I came this close to saying yes because I knew I wouldn't be able to see or hear it. I thought, well, what kind of life is that? What kind of life can I have after that? And he kept begging me, begging me. Finally, I told him, I said, you know what? I'm not listening to you anymore. Amen. And when I said that, I woke up from the coffee. Amen. And um, Amen. so <laughs> it was a pretty amazing experience. And I often wonder to this day, was it a dream? <laughs> or did it really happen? So I'll leave that to your imagination. But I just find it very interesting um, that that did happen. So when I woke up, of course, I was totally blind, couldn't see anything. I was totally deaf, couldn't hear anything, couldn't move. I was paralyzed uh, mostly on my left side, had a feeding tube, you know, and the works. I mean, I was just really uh, a vegetable. And uh, if it hadn't been for the Lord, uh, I don't know what I would have done. Um, and I, I realized uh, that I needed God, and so I brought God back into my life. And uh, then I. Wanted, I knew I could get better uh, services here in California. So, uh, with uh, much, much prayer and faith, and uh, these days you have to have a lot of faith just living with AIDS, much less being blind and deaf. But I, I took a bus, uh, a Greyhound bus, all the way from Atlanta wow. to Stockton, California, which is in the valley. Um, and, uh, but God provided, and there were people on the bus that helped me uh, when we got off the bus, and they made sure I got back on the bus. And so I know the angels were with me. And eventually I worked my way to San Francisco, and here I am. Uh, so it's been an amazing journey, and I would just want to thank the church for supporting me over the years. Um, I first came to know Freedom in Christ in 2002. Um, so it's been an amazing journey. And But I want to admonish you that if you have not been tested, please test, because you may not be feeling anything, um, I believe I was positive from 1984, uh, and I, but I didn't, I was healthy, and uh, so I didn't find out until 96 uh, in the hospital, you know, with the diagnosis of meningitis, and, and the doctor said, oh, besides meningitis, you'll be happy to know you're HIV positive, so that's a heck of a way to find out. I don't think you want to find out that way, and I want you to remember this, if you don't remember anything else, um, I went into the hospital with car keys, and I came out with this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. testing is extremely important. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest ex example that um, my, my parents set for me is in regards to really being accessible to the community and really kind of not just focusing on the word of um, the, just like the message and the preaching and all that kind of, which I think is, I mean, it's a church and of course all these needs are spiritual, they're rooted in, in like spiritual needs, but I think that in terms of the, the, the physical and the material needs that are really, that are real, that affect folks in terms of getting to church um, as, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, Doug. Doug mentioned earlier in terms of just even just the logistics of getting to church sometimes could be so like overwhelming that I think that just thinking practically and thinking of how can we support our neighbors, how we can support our community um, is really important. I think that in that, then we start to see um, that the church really starts to create a safe space for folks and a haven, not just for the, um, the spiritual um, aspect of their life, but in just in these other areas that I think that speaks to people in terms of building trust and community. And um, I think that's like one of the biggest things is really br bridging that link and in the outreach that we do, and in, in, in the ways that the church can message that out, it's it's really important to to like where is the community, and how can we be accessible to the community, and not just expect that folks are going to kind of, you know, just because we say we're welcoming churches, but how do how are we really reflecting that? So, and I think also we live in this cocoon here in San Francisco in this Bay Area. Uh, with marriage equality coming, we think everything's going to be hunky dory. I was in Toledo back in the spring, and I wound up having police protection because my life was threatened because I was that bad, as one letter said. To me, spirituality is about getting our hands dirty, sharing our faith, putting our feet on the ground. To believe in Jesus means we got there and work our asses off, frankly. That's good. That's good. Doug, do you want to share something? Yeah. Um, from a, a personal basis, I, I would think 
more uh, visitation. I know the church has programs where they go out and they do it as a whole church to visit um, different organizations uh, around town. Um, but people with HIV tend to feel isolated. I know I do. And I'm physically isolated many times because it's hard for me to get out. I live way, not that far away, about five miles away from the church, but it's very difficult to get here. And uh, I've had much trouble with my foot and haven't been able to come. So um, I know a lot of you probably know somebody with HIV. Uh, but even if you don't, try to get to know somebody. Go to one of these organizations and volunteer uh, and bring the Spirit of Christ to the Tenderloin. Uh, you can bring the freedom in Christ with you uh, wherever you go. Um, but I think if you take time out and visit with HIV people, uh, not only will they be blessed, but you will be blessed too uh, with their stories. And, and just you being there will mean more to them than you can possibly know. So I encourage you to find someone, visit with them, and pray for them, and you will be the better person for it. Um, oh, sorry, you wanted to chime in too. Uh, I'd like to say that um, we have to really talk about HIV. Um, I feel like everything starts with conversation and through talking about it openly with your congregation. Start a conversation, talk to people about HIV. Get tested and just normalize it into our everyday lives. And I think that that is what will really bring positive change. As, as because of the cocktail that's come out and everything, I think we have just kind of forgotten, you know, uh, the HIV, the people with HIV and AIDS. I, th I really do think we have. And, uh, you know, and we seem to uh, like to gravitate more to the, you know, the issues of, of gay marriage and uh, marriage equality and things to that nature. And uh, because it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard to see people you love uh, not feeling well, feeling sick, or people you, that you don't even know, feeling not feeling well, feeling sick, and, and trying to just be there for them. And so I, I advocate and, and encourage. I know it's not easy, you know, to get involved either in an organization that they're doing, or to visit your brother Doug, you know, pick him up. Doug loves to just talk. He likes to go out to dinner and just chat it up. Take Doug out. You know, Terry and I try to take Doug out once a month because that's what my schedule allows. But we'll go, Doug loves, like, go to, you know, uh, you know, Red Lobster. Or, he was saying he loves the Arden, Olive Garden. Take Doug out. You know, take him out for a sandwich. Chat it up with Doug. You know, go shopping with Doug. Take Doug to Target. He likes Target. You know, do something with Doug. I, mean, I just, uh, from, in terms of San Francisco, I think that, and just nationally, too, I think that the funding for, um, for care and for services um, is is being cut. I mean, we we yes. have Mayor Lee who is backfilling this next fiscal year for all the the um, Department of Public Health and HIV um, care and AIDS care. Um, but that's I mean that's just this next fiscal year. Um, there's always like I just remember last year there was this question of like there was this plea you know from the community that. Um, you know, because the national strategy in HIV is changing to, um, and is then affecting in terms of cuts, um, we're needing to really strategize and come together as a community and to kind of raise um, that advocacy level um, and be and show up, like when those budget hearings, when those town halls happen, that it does make a difference to what, how, how the city then prioritizes its money um, to, to the services that, that exist and to maintain those services. Um, every single year, um, smaller uh, smaller organizations that don't have a capacity of a larger infrastructure have been closing. I mean, we just rec recently saw the Native American AIDS Project close um, this this last year, and so I think that if we if we again, I think it's about our focus as a community, as an LGBT trans queer community, that like where are we putting that focus, and how are then we see how are we then seeing the community slowly being um, diminished through the services that we're providing. And so I guess it's really kind of reprioritizing where we're um, putting our advocacy efforts. Is it marriage equality? Is it these other kind of maybe middle class and upper class like values? Or is it more of like the needs of the community that are, that are and really kind of realizing who are, who are those that are most affected by, by these.